have been engaged for a number of years in study with the philosophy of Plato and uh, have been trying to develop my own uh, theory about the what William Altman, A-L-T-M-A-N, Altman, William Altman, who has written some very nice books recently on Plato and appears to be, uh, to me, along with J.B. Kennedy, uh, one of the most serious scholars of Plato alive today. And it seems like he has gone after this problem that Strauss set in, um, in a book on, by, a book by Cooper, and, uh, I'm trying to think of the name of the text right now, and sometimes I don't remember that, I usually remember the name of texts. It's about political philosophy, and it's about, uh, by Cooper, and it is the exchanges of letters between Eric Vuglin and Leo Strauss, and so in uh, in Emberley and Cooper's text on political philosophy, uh, they Strauss in there highlights that the the whole all of Plato's dialogues constitute a myth, and you have to try to find your way in those dialogues by finding the interconnection of all the dialogues. And so Altman has set himself the task, and J. B. Kennedy the author of the musical structure of Plato's dialogues, uh, recalling there, in a sense, the structure and structure of Scientific Revolutions by Kuhn. Um, and uh, so also another book, Structure and Interpretation of Quantum Mechanics by R.I.G. Hughes. But uh, Altman, I began talking about Altman because Altman has discovered that Plato's dialogues uh, very likely do have an interconnection and need to be read in a certain order to be understood or to be understood properly as Plato intended those. So I've been, I have entered the race here with Altman to see who can explain more of the dialogic structure, which of us, is, uh, which of us can explain more Plato and more of the structure of Plato's dialogues in the end. So it's a friendly competition between William Altman, Jeff Neusel, J.B. Kennedy, and anybody else who takes it up. It's a mystery. The dialogues are a mystery, and they have a definite interconnection that can be demonstrated. But I'll give a clue to it. They, they are tetralogies. In the tradition that goes back to Thrasyllus, and the reading of Plato as creating tetralogies is a very important insight because he, it, it comprehends that Plato was definitely thinking of count, uh, creating his own counter form of art to the art of Aeschylus, Sophocles, Euripides, and Aristophanes where they would present at their celebrations on a, on a certain schedule of the calendar in Athens, they would present these uh, plays, and there'd be like three, there'd be three serious plays, uh, if you will, three tragedies, and then there'd be a satyr play, which is kind of a comedy. So if you take this insight into the dialogues, and then you see that, uh, for instance, to give one tetralogy, you have Theotetus, Sophist statesman and philosopher and then in another tetralogy that's parallel runs parallel to that one you have um you have euthyphro you have apology you have crito and then you have phaedo then you can kind of ask yourself is plato also structuring them that way where you have three tragedies and then you have a satyr play which is kind of a comedy as the fourth one so, you know, in that, in certain reading there, since Plato didn't actually supply the dialogue philosopher, it's my own belief, and I'll put it out there because then it'll put some pressure on Altman and J.B. Kennedy to actually get more of the form of the dialogues, but I will suggest that since Plato didn't write the philosopher, and that was supposed to happen on successive days, the first, the first day they were going to discuss the question of what is knowledge, and this happens to be on the very same day that the euthyphro begins. 
and that that dialogue is what is piety. And Socrates going before the King Archon at Athens, and he's being accused of being impious. But the only accusation you see put forward in the Euthyphro is put forward by Euthyphro himself of his father. Um, and it's, it begins with, a, it's kind of a murder mystery. It begins with who, who, what did, was Euthyphro's father guilty of impiety for taking the life of a slave of his? And so Socrates gets into this long, he's supposed to be there to be accused by a King Archon who never appears in the Euthyphro. So it lead, lead, led me to believe that Socrates himself, under his student Xenophon, uh, during the Peloponnesian War, was actually the King Archon. Because he always said, I accuse myself. I don't let others accuse me. I accuse myself. So it's a dialogue where he's actually bringing charges to, before himself, uh, but it takes place as in the form of a conversation between himself and Euthyphro about what is impiety. Because Euthyphro asserts that it is Im impious, Im impious, for uh, that, for the father of Euthyphro, whom we don't meet, uh, it might be Socrates. Because Socrates could very well have uh, children with Xantippe, but he might have had a child with someone else. And that child might have been named Euthyphro. And so Euthyphro might be bringing the very charge against Socrates himself and saying, you're guilty of impiety and you're guilty of not believing in the gods of the city of Athens. And so then Socrates, he can take that knowledge of Euthyphro and show that it can't be possible because he had, he had a discussion that very day with the mathematician Theotetus. And in the Theotetus, his attempt to find knowledge of anything, the most rigorous scientific principles, led to an aporia, which led to no knowledge. There was knowledge that there was no knowledge. See, so it's very important to see that root in uh, Theotetus actually stretching up into the Euthyphro and presenting itself as Socrates' accusation against Athens for accusing him of impiety. He's accusing Athens of impiety because he's saying, if we had no knowledge, then we had no knowledge of anybody being impious. I can't accuse anybody else of being impious. But what leads Socrates into that, and it happens on the same day, as I say. So if you're someone who's out there and you're going to look for the truth of Plato's dialogues, you try to find which dialogues happen on the same days of the Peloponnesian War. So you're basically taking and you're reconstructing certain principal events of the Peloponnesian War. Just like in the United States in the 60s, if I were telling a story by writing dialogues that happened on different days of the Vietnam War, a very important one would happen on the day of the Tet Offensive. A very important one might happen on the day of the Cuban Missile Crisis. Because we can't forget that the Cuban Missile Crisis, the Bay of Pigs incident, and um, the Cuban Revolution, 1959, all happened on days of the Vietnam War. So see, that's a parallel. If I were telling a story about it, each of those very important events that we, one would find in Thucydides. Now remember the philosopher Hobbes, he translates one work from the antiquity. Hobbes makes, his, Hobbes makes, one, Hobbes makes one of the most ridiculous comments in the history of, of philosophy and he said I read all the ancient poets I read everything that the ancient poets said and they I did I didn't learn anything from them you know and then he make goes on to make an assertion that there was no political science until he came along that there was not any kind of science but he must have been saying that he learned something from Thucydides because he chooses to translate Thucydides from the ancient Greek he brings that into English with his translation of the Peloponnesian War. So really what a, per what a real serious student of Plato is trying to do is you're trying to take the events that Thucydides makes thematic during the Peloponnesian War and you're asking on which day of this particular battle, say the, um, the Syracuse invasion, on which day what dialogues are happening in Athens on that day when Alcibiades uh, is involved in Syracuse, what things are happening. See, that's around the time that the symposium is written on love or eros or bodily love 
And so there's a question in, in, in Plato there as to what relationship bodily love or the kind of love that's being celebrated in a very different way by the five uh, or so uh, interlocutors or people, fellow conversants of Socrates in the dialogue on love, which I actually have dated around 413 and around the time that um, Alcibiades uh, was accused in Athens of trying to bring about a tyranny. Um, so it's kind of a way that, of you to, to, to be guided by Thucydides to see that, in a way, at least in the Socratic dialogues of Plato. Now remember, those, those dialogues take place when Plato's like, well, when he's like one years old, two years old, five years old, eight years old, 12 years old, for basically for 27 years, up until his 27th year. See, it's the 27 years for the Peloponnesian War, and that begins in 431. So it goes on to 404 BC, when, on my own reading, that's when Xenophon comes back. He returns um, during between 404 and 399, the death of Socrates. We have the question of whether Xenophon himself was involved in coming back to Athens and then founding if you will, with political power, the new ac academy, which brings us to the religious event or the religious celebration that Socrates is on his way to in the Republic before the conversation of Theosemicus begins. And I consider that to be like probably one of the highest dialogues that took place. And we don't get to see it, but it's a dialogue between Socrates, Xenophon. And um, by that time, it could be, let's see, 62, it could be that Aristotle is present at that conversation already in Plato, in the way that Plato constructs it, see. So that religious celebration, I suggest, for the beginning of the Republic, just as a suggestion, it's not, these are ways that you can, heuristics, that you can use for entering into the arteries of the Platonic dialogues, and that is that Socrates' own accusation against himself, if you will, and him putting himself to death, is like one of the first events of the new Spartan-influenced Athenian society after the end of the Peloponnesian War. So that in those four or five years between, um, between 404 and 399, we get the most important political events in Athens, and we get to see the force of philosophy and how philosophy during the war was able to consolidate power um, through, in a sense, the corruption of the house of Thucydides, and uh, or not Thucydides, rather, but um, uh, Pericles, and how that, that then introduces like the new way of life and philosophy that is essentially the life that Plato lived from um, for 60 years after the death of Socrates, and studied in the academy during those years with Aristotle for 20 years. So then some of the greatest conversations that took place in the ancient world, we never heard them because those were between Plato's students and Aristotle and when Aristotle was one of his students there. 